is a quantity in physics called linear momentum. Um, we're going to discuss it first for the case of just a single particle. Uh, if we take the mass of that particle times its velocity, then that is what we call its momentum. Um, we use the symbol P for momentum for sort of anachronistic reasons. Um, it's originally written out as, uh, instead of momentum, the word impetus. And uh, from impetus, there is uh, a Latin uh, root word pater, uh, which is to go. And so from pater, we have the P uh, to this day. Linear momentum is going to give rise to a conservation law, as we can see in Newton's second law of motion here on the second line. If the net force on an object is zero, then the time derivative of its momentum is zero, which means that the momentum you integrate both sides, that gives you momentum as a constant. Um, if I have many particles together or some system, then you can write out the momentum of the system is going to tell us uh, the total mass times the velocity of the center mass is the momentum of the system. Uh, and then if the system is isolated, then the net force acting on the system is zero. And so the uh, momentum of the system is constant. Um, this formulation of Newton's second law of motion in terms of momentum is advantageous and more general um, because uh, it allows us to deal with cases where the mass is also changing. So like most famously a rocket, uh, as it is burning up its oxidizer and fuel is losing mass. And so um, the thrust becomes more effective the longer the rocket is burning because the rocket has less inertia and you need to take that into account. So if you have a system where the mass is changing, um, then you should turn to momentum as a way uh, to uh, address its motion. Because uh, if you look at the standard formulation for Newton's second law of motion, F equals ma, you're assuming that I could pull this time derivative past the mass. The mass is not changing. And then I'm getting the time derivative of the velocity, which is the acceleration. Okay. That uh, formulation is going to give us, uh, after a little rearrangement, what is called the impulse momentum theorem. Uh, I want to try to set the stage for the impulse momentum theorem. So here's a stop motion photograph, one of Doc Edgerton's photographs of a softball being struck by a bat. So this is going to be our, our mental prototype for a collision, uh, a sort of short time duration interaction in which the impulse momentum theorem is going to be uh, valuable to us. So a little bit about how the picture was taken. Uh, so Doc Edgerton was a physicist at MIT, uh, and he developed a mechanism for making a very precisely timed, very short duration uh, bursts of light uh, from a stroboscope. And he would have various things set up in his lab uh, in complete darkness, except for like the instant when the strobe goes on. And so you could catch like these amazing things that um, are just exist on too short of a time scale for your eyes to perceive, like the softball wrapping itself around the bat or uh, the drop of milk splashing up to make a crown or, uh, you know, famous images you might have seen of a bullet going through a playing card or a, a, a balloon. So things that, that happen, but happen on such a short time scale that our senses can't perceive it. But of course, electronically, there's no problem in detecting them at all. Speed of light is really fast. Um, for the next slide, I want to just run a little movie to show what that interaction between a ball and a bat looks like.
You wouldn't ordinarily think of a baseball as being deformable like that. And you could see it ringing after the collision as well. Um, so there are sorts of short time duration interactions where for that short time duration, the force that the bat and the ball are exerting on each other are going to be complicated dependence on time and various things happen. Uh, but it's a short enough interaction in time that we can replace that complicated time dependent force with a simpler average force over that time interval. It will result in the same change in momentum. Uh, and that's what we're trying to illustrate with these diagrams. So let's say the force that the bat exerts on the ball, which is minus the force that the ball exerts on the bat, uh, is this purple curve on the left. So rises quickly, decays off more slowly, uh, but it goes to zero outside this time interval for the it's a contact force. So when the bat and the ball aren't touching one another, then there can't be a contact force. And for what I want to do is integrate, right? Then the area under this curve is the impulse associated with that force as a function of time over this time interval. So we find the impulse associated with the force by integrating from the time the force first exists to the last time that the force exists. Uh, and what we can do to make things simpler for ourselves is instead uh, replace that realistic curve of a force that exists over a short time interval with an equivalent average force that gives me the same area, but just as you know, the area of a rectangle. Um, and that's what we're going to do for these brief collisions and interactions where the detailed structure of this function doesn't matter. What matters is we're relating the before and the after, before the collision, after the collision. And we could just imagine that there is an equivalent average force that gives the same impulse. So when we write out the impulse momentum theorem, we have that same impulse J, uh, but now we'll think of it in terms of an average constant force over the time interval of the interaction, and the impulse causes a change in momentum. Uh, and this is just Newton's second law of motion again. You're saying that the uh, average net force is equal to uh, the change in momentum over a change in time. We're just letting the time interval go from infinitesimal to you know, perhaps something short but finite, like the time that a, a bat and a ball are colliding with each other. Uh, what we learn from the impulse momentum theorem as a, as a way to think through things in physics is uh, if I want to catch something, I could catch that with um, a large force over a short time interval. It's probably going to hurt or a smaller force over a longer time interval. Uh, so like catching a baseball, you definitely want to let the ball fall back into your glove as you're catching it, as opposed to pushing your glove into it. Um, one of those is going to be much more painful than the other. And I think the best example of this is if you've ever done an egg toss. Uh, in an egg toss, you know, throw an uncooked egg to your uh, unfortunate companion in the in the event. Um, so you throw it so it follows some parabola, and then the, your partner is going to catch it by having it fall into their hand as their hand itself is falling along a parabolic trajectory. And the reason you catch it that way, and the reason that's most likely to work, um, is because you're extending this time of the interaction. So to bring the egg to rest because the delta p is fixed, you're going to bring the egg to rest. Um, you're doing that with as small a force as possible by having a longer time interval. So you're less likely to cause the shell to fracture. All right. Let's clean up a bit. And let's try some questions. 
So during the filming of a movie, stunt person jumps from the roof uh, of a tall building, but there's no injury because a person lands on a large air-filled bag. Which one of the following best describes why no injury occurs? So read through those possibilities. Uh, think which one is correct, given what we know about impulse and momentum. Uh, and then if you've talked it over with your physics friend, let us uh, join back up. All right. So no injury occurs because the bag increases the amount of time during which the momentum is changing and that reduces the average force on the person. Um, so the change of momentum does not reduce because you're, you're coming to rest. So you have your momentum right before you hit the bag. Your final momentum is zero. That's set in stone. Nothing you can do about that. What you can do is you can uh, cause that change of momentum to stop with a long time interaction and a small force or a short time of interaction and a large force or, or anything in between. All right. Uh, bag decreases the amount of time. No, that would be the wrong direction. Uh, the bag provides a necessary force to stop the person. But that's true, but so would a, a block of cement. That would also provide the force, just on the way you would like. Uh, and the bag reduces the impulse to the person. No, the impulse is the change of momentum. You you can't change that. You can change what force corresponds to that impulse. All right, let's try another one. A football, a mass M, initially at rest, is kicked uh, so that it leaves the foot at a speed V. If T represents the duration of the collision between the ball and the foot, which one of the following expressions determine the magnitude of the average force exerted on the ball? So a little dimensional analysis. Which of these um, could give us the magnitude of the average force? So think it through. Go back to the impulse momentum theorem when you're ready uh, to go ahead with the answer. Unpause the video and we'll join back up. All right, so dimensionally, what corresponds to a force is going to be um, mass times speed divided by the time interval, which these this is the same units as you have for momentum over time. Uh, so a little bit about units. Um, momentum, we could say, is in units of newtons times seconds. Uh, or it could also say that um, the unit of momentum is kilogram meter per second. So this is pretty obviously that combination of units. But I could also, if I wanted, write it out as a newton times a second, which sometimes that's more useful to think of a, an impulse as a force times a time interval, which causes a change of momentum. Um, you might note that for energy, we had a unit of measure, the joule, and for power, we have the watt, joule per second. There's not actually a name for that combination, newton times second or kilogram meter per second. Um, it's also sort of an indication that uh, while conservation of linear momentum is useful and it's helpful in some situations, it's not necessarily um, the most foundational, at least in physics at this level. Um, once you get to higher level physics, like classical mechanics, you're going to think about momentum and, and coordinates in a, in a much deeper and richer way. Uh, but for right now, at this level, um, uh, it is a little bit more like an appendix than it is a full organ. Useful, maybe, for niche operations. Okay. Let's try another one. Three events are observed at a baseball game. 
baseball is thrown by a pitcher, starts from rest, and is traveling at 38 meters per second as it flies towards the catcher. So going from zero to plus 38 meters per second. Baseball is traveling at 38 meters per second when it enters the catcher's glove and stops. So it goes from plus 38 meters per second to zero. Case three, uh, baseball is traveling at plus 38 meters per second. It hits a wall and bounces away from the wall at minus 38 meters per second. The change in the momentum of the baseball has the largest magnitude in which of those cases. So think it through, talk it over, uh, and see what conclusion you can draw. All right, and this uh, is three, uh, and we need to come back to what change means in physics. So when I say delta uh, momentum, delta P, change in anything is P final factor minus E initial factor. Uh, and so if you compare one and two, they have the same magnitude change in momentum because I've got a 38 meters per second for one and a zero for the other. Now, a lot of times people want to think that um, you're going to wind up with the plus 38 meters per second and minus 38 meters per second canceling out. That is not true because of this minus sign. Uh, indeed, what you're going to find is that the change in momentum is twice as big um, for case three as it is for two or one. Okay. And that's a general observation uh, as we get into uh, collisions and thinking about collisions. When an object bounces, the change of momentum is greater uh, than if it uh, sticks. So just sticking is this case of going from 38 meters per second to zero, and it sticks in the glove. All right. Ping pong ball and a bowling ball are rolling toward you. Both have the same momentum. You exert the same force to stop each. How do the time intervals to stop them compare? Takes less time to stop the ping pong ball. Both take the same. Takes more time to stop the ping pong ball. So think through what you think the answer is. Uh, and then when you come to consensus with your physics friend, unpause the video and we'll go from there. So they're both going to take the same time. So let's write out their impulse momentum theorem. So we're exerting the same force. We're asking about the time interval. And that impulse is equal to the change in momentum. All right. So both have the same momentum and you stop each. So delta P is the same for both the ping pong ball and the bowling ball. Um, also given the fact that you use the same force to stop each. So this force is the same. Therefore, delta T, the time interval to stop them has to be the same. All right, let's try another one. Related, but different. Ping pong ball and a bowling ball are both run towards you. Both have the same momentum. Use the same force to stop each. Now, how do the distances needed to stop them compare? It's shorter for the ping pong ball. Both take the same distance. It takes a longer distance to stop the ping pong ball. So think about what you think the answer is. Talk it over with your neighbor, uh, your physics friend, and then unpause the video and we'll talk about it. I would encourage you to think about what's different about this question compared to the previous question. All right, it is going to take a longer distance to stop the ping pong ball. 
So let's talk about why that is. So here we have work is equal to force, ugly F, dot product into a displacement, um, conservation of energy is equal to change in kinetic energy, so K final minus K initial. And they both end at rest, so I can throw away K final. So force dotted into displacement is equal to minus K initial. All right, and then how does momentum help us think about this? Well, kinetic energy is a half mass times speed squared, but I know what kinetic energy is in terms of momentum. So I can rewrite this kinetic energy as momentum squared over twice mass. And for the ping pong ball, that mass is tiny. It's in the denominator. So its kinetic energy is huge compared to the bowling ball. If they have the same momentum, uh, the ping pong ball is moving really fast. So it has a large amount of kinetic energy, and it's therefore going to take a lot longer distance to stop it. They both have the same momentum, use the same force to stop each, must have a larger displacement to stop the ping pong ball. Is that ping pong ball is booking. All right.